when Dan was talking about like you know drowning in data and not getting access to data, uh, I relate to all that. You know, I deal with that. Uh, all that is true stuff. And uh, being from India, you know, all my uh, genes are all screwed up. But I can't do math like Dan either. You know, like uh, all, all Asians are not equal. Just to just to clarify that. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no disclosures. You know, I'm still trying to figure out how to make some money out of it. Just pouring money into all this stuff, so, uh, spending my own money. Okay, so we're going to talk talk a little bit about uh, machine learning. Uh, can't spend like more than five minutes on that based on the time. Tell you about current state of research. What are people working on? So that you get a landscape and a panoramic view of the whole thing. And then talk about like you know where is it going in healthcare? Where is machine learning or AI going in healthcare? So artificial intelligence, for for a simple sake, you know, a loaded word, a big deal, but it has a lot of different components. I'm not going to go into individual ones, but as you can see, machine learning is one part of that. Deep learning, which is the newer evolving science, is another part of that, and the neural nets uh, is another subset of that. So people talk about AI all the time, but it has a lot of different. Uh, parts and pieces to that. So you have to be careful about how you use these words. So here is an example. How many people uh, are trained in machine learning or AI? Raise your hand. And you can code and other. Okay, so I can say whatever and others will believe me. Uh, so the, the two key components, uh, I think about it in simplistic, for simplistic sake, is uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And what you're trying to do is create an algorithm that will take the input data and give you a desired output. So in this example, if you look on the orange section, we have this supervised learning algorithm that we are training, and we show it like a dog, dog, and we're basically pro providing it with like this classification of what these characters are, what's not a duck, what's not a duck. And then we develop this predictive model so that next time when we show it a duck, the predictive model calls it a duck. Whereas on the blue, section, which is the unsupervised learning, it picks up from like different features. It'll say, like, OK, does it have a beak? Does it have feathers? Can it walk? You know, does it quack? Does it do other things? And then it figures out, well, looks like few of them are ducks. One is a rabbit, and one is something that I don't know. <laughs> so now we are going to do this over here. So you're all <laughs> not trained in AI, because this was a primer. So you will help me out. And there are a lot of people who say, like, you know, AI is bullshit. It's, mu it's all magic stuff. There is this black box and other things. So let's see, you know, how will we do in California? So you all know, male or female? <laughs> all right, that was easy. How about male or female? Uh, maybe, right? Like you can't say sometimes. <laughs> male or female? <laughs> ah, now you got stuck. That's why you need machine learning and AI. So here is a paper. <laughs> Here is a paper where they were looking at retinal fundus, and they were looking at it for prediction of like cardiovascular disease states and other disease states. But well, what they also found was that these fundus exams looking into your eye, which is done routinely by the ophthalmologist, can give you a lot more information with a high grade of accuracy. And that is pretty relevant and important, because this is existing data that we can leverage for many, many other things. Just like we heard in the first talk, it's not just about hypertension or hyperlipidemia. There are other factors that are important. Maybe we'll discover certain other factors that are very relevant and important. So machine learning and AI is important in discovering new sciences, in discovering new patterns, in discovering new treatment and their, its impact. And uh, that's why it's growing in its application. So what we wanted to do was in 20, uh, 2019, that is last year, look at, OK, what happened in this area? in healthcare. What were the studies that were done? What kind of research was done? So we put together a group uh, of us. And then we subsequently looked at all this research through PubMed. And I'll show you uh, here, 22, uh, sorry, 2,274 articles. We excluded a lot of them. This was based on PubMed search. 1,068 relevant articles is what we found. And I'm going to go through each one of them in the next 10 minutes, right? No, OK. I'll present to you the curated information. This is what we found. Oncology and imaging are the front runners, partly because they have a lot of data. And they have a lot of data that you can access easily. If you're trying to sift through uh, clinical notes and other things, it's much, much harder. So oncology and imaging are the front runners. And so are like some of these other uh, groups. 
acute care, the gas man area and the ICU area is somewhere like right there in the middle, but a lot of predictive analytics work, work going on in that space. I'm gonna go through some of these uh, areas. So we took like a pot puree, you know, like there are like a bunch of uh, articles or a bunch of research that has been done which applies to everything. So like general, a uh, lot of them were reviews talking about uh, machine learning, talking about its application, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, some generic stuff, a lot of drug discovery studies. So there is a lot of work going on using machine learning to identify new drugs or application of existing drugs in a different way. So a lot of work going on in that area. And we did include a lot of specialty specific articles, but we thought like they were very relevant and important uh, to general concepts in machine learning in healthcare. So here's an example. This was like pretty, uh, pretty impressive. And what this gr uh, group at uh, Google was uh, essentially trying to do solve the data problem that Dan was just talking about. Like all this data is buried, there are interoperability issues, the data structure is not standard, and that's essentially what they were trying to do. But what they also discovered in the process was that if you have a good model, your predictions for readmissions, for mortality and all can be pretty good. So that's what they discovered in this uh, particular uh, research work. Oncology, as I said, was like a front runner uh, in 2018 and continues to be in 2019. And there was a lot of work that was done around breast cancer, uh, lung cancer, especially it links a lot to imaging. Think about like mammographies, think about those CT scans that have been done for, for, this, uh, for the lung cancer. A Lot of reviews and a lot of focus on radiotherapies too. So they're trying to see how radiotherapy can be a little bit more focused you can have a faster design of the, the radiotherapy dosing through machine learning and more precision dosing through that. So a lot of work going on in all these different areas. Imaging, as I talked about, across all different areas, but also in relationship with oncology and behavioral sciences. So the patients who have schizophrenia who get MRIs, are there any patterns that we can discover? Patients who have these lung cancers or these abdominal cancers, can we see any patterns that previously haven't been discovered? And this evolving science of radiomics. So what you do is you take an image, whether it's a chest X-ray, whether it's a MRI, or whether it's a CT scan, and you try to find out new features which might help you tell the prognosis, which might help you change your treatment plans in a better way. So a lot of work going on in taking the features that are there on that image, which we previously never thought about in the same way, and correlating them with pathology, correlating them with outcomes. So really path-breaking work going on in this area. Uh, critical care, of course, I'm biased, so I'm gonna talk about it over here. You're looking at like the mechanical ventilation waveform. So mechanical ventilation is the breathing machine, and there are waveforms on that. And many times we look at the numbers, but we don't look at the waveforms necessarily. And we are now looking at those patterns of waveforms to see if we can find more meaningful information. A lot of predictive analytics work, who's going to die, who's likely to have low blood pressure in the ICU, who's likely to get septic, a lot of work going on in that space too. And early warning systems being designed for those uh, predictive analytic tools. And Things like delirium, which in the past have been like hard to solve. Delirium is when you go to the ICU and you, meet, you get confused. Now it's not because of the doctor necessarily, the ICU environment is very chaotic, you're very sick, that's why you get, get uh, confused over there. But how do you predict that? How, what can you do to impact that? So a lot of discovery work going on in that area. Cardiovascular, you probably all know, now you have, a lot of people have Apple Watches and they're doing like all these EKG interpretations. So a lot of research goes into that area to discover, okay, what are the different patterns? How can we make it effective? And that is what it was. And of course, AFib got a lot of press last year uh, and a lot of research related to that. And lastly, this imaging for ischemic conditions. So we all have this heart attack problems and ischemic heart disease problems and co trying to correlate the images, like an echocardiogram or a stress test and the images thereof to try to discover new patterns which we previously could not think of. Here you're getting this enormous amount of data and you're trying to discover new patterns. Some uh, special mentions, typically we don't think about psychiatry necessarily as a place or behavioral sciences as a place where you would apply machine learning or AI. But they're doing innovative work not just taking out data from electronic health record, but also from social media texts.
to discover suicide patterns, to discover if patient's treatment response is better or not. So a lot of innovative work going on in that. Again, ophthalmology and neurology talks more about use of imaging data. So if you see, it's a lot of patterns that are being discovered or uh, are being utilized to get better information. Few other specialties, pathology, genetics, GI, I'm gonna skip that. But next time you go for like a colonoscope, you might find that the gastroenterologist is using the C-scope with a camera that is providing better information, AI-guided information, in terms of what's tumor, what's not tumor, this is the area you should biopsy, this is the area you should not biopsy. And that's all better pattern recognition. Now, it doesn't take away the gastroenterologist, and it doesn't take away the colonoscope, but it makes them more effective. It makes those biopsies much, much better. And then <coughs> democratization of uh, machine learning. Think about, we think about US, we think about uh, uh, all the developed countries, but look at that example in Nigeria, and people are trying to solve local problems using machine learning. That's truly impressive. And I think knowledge and skill, skill sets have been democratized. That's the power of ML in this. People are not just, just generating one algorithm, they're generating multiple algorithms because they already have the data, and they're doing comparisons and validations of those algorithms. Natural language processing is an evolving field because a lot of uh, data that you get in healthcare are those clinical notes, are those texts. So how to extract them, how to make them meaningful, and that's been part of our work too. And this last one is education, which I love, where a lot of residents, students, and even high school students are getting involved in this because it's democratization of the skill set, so they are using this knowledge to apply in healthcare. We still struggle with validation challenge. This came out in 2019. They looked at 31,000 studies. They looked at, they selected 82, which, had, which were like reasonable, but they found only 25 had external validation. We still struggle, so maybe Dan will help us, help us solve this problem, get this uh, faster paced uh, research, but we still struggle with this validation right now. Uh, Srinivas is right there. He's uh, one of my colleagues at Clinic Lake. He's helping me out with the 2019 review. So we are going through 3,000 plus articles. That's why we're here, look a little bit uh, unsettled. Uh, <laughs> we will have uh, specialist editorials for the next one, for the 2019 review, where it will have the cardiologist talking about what they found in the cardiology literature. We'll have the nephrologist talking about the kidney one. So we are going through this, and it will be available through our webpage, brinexcommunity.com. In the meantime, if you want to find out what was like really relevant and important and hit like some of the important discussion, these articles for 2019 are already available. We have curated them based on the different specialities and uh, links are directly available so that you can go to those, those uh, articles. All that research is fine, but what about application? Look at this cluster. These are like the FDA approvals for AI algorithms and this is expanding and exploding right now. So all that research is helping us get to practical applications of AI in healthcare. So it's reality. People who say, oh, this is the future. No, 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 this is the present. So better start with that. But here's the challenge. I still feel that a lot of stuff over there is still in the lunar mission phase. You know, developing the concept, research development, validation, and uh, going through those stepwise cycles. What it requires for true change in healthcare is Mission Mars. We need to think about disruption in disruptive technology. Like how do you change the existing methods and how do you go about creating newer science and application of this new science that is going to be very impactful. So if you can see the difference, the top one is how we went to moon, and you can see how NASA has a completely different strategy. It's a completely different technology, and it's a completely different funding level that will take it to Mars, and that's what we need for successful AI application, application in healthcare. And when you look at machine lear learning algorithms, they have also evolved, and they're continuously evolving. Like every single year, some of these techniques are changing. What we had as like the supervised and the unsupervised one, we're going more towards evolving reinforcement learning applications that are going into robotics and more automated stuff and where uh, more autonomous uh, activities are happening in machine learning. And that's where we need to go to make it more effective and get away from manual processing and biases that exist. 
So this is some of the work that we are doing. Uh, we published this last year. We're trying to get the text data or all sources of data that might exist in EHR, and then trying to create some uh, a neural network to get to ICD-10 prediction. But the whole idea is, if there is all this data, just like Dan was talking about, why can't we extract it and get some meaningful information about it? And that's essentially what we need to do. So some of the key takeaways in medicine and healthcare, it's all about patients and clinicians first. That's the most important thing. People think about algorithms and all these different solutions, but think about these are going to impact our lives. So we have to have these solutions which have to be focused on patients and clinicians first. Think about the strategy. You know, my co-founder for BrainX, Dr. Pepe, always says the most important thing is not the algorithm, it's the strategy. I didn't, I didn't understand that. You know, it's that Asian brain, it's, mine is slower. But it, it took me some time to understand that. But the strategy is extremely important. So don't jump to the algorithm. Think about your strategy first. Integrated solutions which take EHR data and non-EHR data are going to be more effective. Integrated solutions that take not just imaging data, but also take the, the text data and the imaging data together will be more effective. So think about integrated solutions. Regulatory changes are already occurring, and we have to lead this work. And think about building community support. So Google, uh, Stack Overflow, GitHub, all these are examples where communities were built around things. We have to do the same, and I think this is a great start over here at this conference and various different communities where we're building these groups, communities where we are coming together to solve these problems for ourselves. And I think the last part, we need to change our attitude from sick care to healthcare. We are very focused on EHR data. We need to think about healthcare. How do we prevent problems from happening in first place? Otherwise, these are very difficult problems to solve for us. Uh, lastly, I don't know if you know Gene Kranz, he was the one who helped Apollo 13 come back to, to Earth. And the real question in my mind is, we still don't have the proof, can AI save lives? And once we get that, then people will start believing, yes, it truly is impactful. And I think that's where we have to go. Thank you very much.